Hey everybody, Chris Brown here with another video for Murmur. I'm fortunate enough to be joined by Yusuf Ahmad, uh, Complex Coronary Operator and uh, CTO Operator at UCSF, Director of the Complex Coronary Program there. Um, he's going to tell us about uh, something pretty cool, uh, and something that I haven't done, but he has, and he's going to give us some advice, and maybe we'll all kind of get involved in this study a little bit more uh, for our patients with refractory angina. Yusuf, thanks, man, for, uh, for talking about this to us. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, you know, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Casira 2 trial, just about, you know, the type of patients that might be suitable, uh, increase a little bit of awareness about the study, talk about the design of it, and then talk a little bit about implanting, um, which is honestly very, very straightforward. Um, so it's a, you know, Casira 2, so there was a previous Casira which evaluated the sinus reducer in a randomized blinded fashion. That was a pretty small study. Uh, there was also recently a you know, non-industry investigator-initiated trial uh, done by my old group um, in the UK uh, at Imperial from the Orbiter group. That was called Orbiter Cosmic, and that was also randomized, blinded, um, placebo-controlled. And both of those you know, smaller studies, but they both showed consistent benefits in terms of reduction of angina in patients who got treated with the reducer versus patients who got treated with the, you know, placebo procedure. Casira 2, I think, is set up to be the definitive trial. You know, if it's positive, that would be a third positive trial for this device in the same indication. It's a bigger trial and it's it's set up in a very, very kind of rigorous, robust way, which presents some challenges, honestly, in terms of trying to get patients into the trial. Um, but I think on the back end, that's really going to pay off because it's, you know, it's, I think it's going to be very difficult to quibble with the trial at the end of it in terms of the way it's been set up. So the randomized portion, and, you know, I'll speak in, in a second about a registry that's available for other patients, but the randomized portion is aimed to be 380 patients. And they need obstructive coronary disease with refractory angina, and they uh, need to be maximally medically tolerated. You really have to work hard on their meds. You have to get them to be on, you know, three or four drugs or at least attempt them on the maximal tolerated doses. You need to document if they can't get more. And they need to have been deemed to have no revascularization options by your own local kind of institution. But it also every case gets reviewed at a case review committee. And if the case review committee feels that actually there maybe are potential targets for revascularization, the patient probably won't get approved at that time. And then you need to go off and treat them, offer them revascularization. If they're still symptomatic, then you bring them back. The patients in the randomized portion of the study need to have left coronary ischemia. So you need to have proven ischemia on a non-invasive test. You can do that in you know multiple ways, you know, stress echo, PET, MRI, pressure wire, it doesn't matter, but it needs to be left coronary distribution. And then those patients are randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either get the reducer or a placebo procedure. 190 patients in each group. Um, before they get in, they also need to have done baseline exercise tests. So they need to be able to exercise and they need to have symptoms on the treadmill. And you need to have a couple of treadmills to show that. And then the primary you know, efficacy endpoint is change in the exercise time duration. And then there are a bunch of safety endpoints and secondary endpoints and a lot of other symptom things. The key to the kind of rigor of the trial is that it's truly, it's placebo controlled. So the patient does not know whether they got the implant or not. None of the people following the patient up clinically can know if the patient got the implant or not. And then that's really gonna allow us to you know, assess the, you know, the true efficacy of reducer. I like it. So, I mean, I guess you, you probably have to get some non-invasive ischemia, though, because if you could pressure wire it, you should be able to fix it, probably. Yes, um, unless there is a particular reason you don't want. So, an example that I could think of potentially is a patient who has got, you know, terrible, you know, malignant restenosis that maybe has been treated a hundred times with brachytherapy and multiple right. sure. layers we're just kind of at the end of the revascularization road. And, yeah. yeah, potentially those, I, I agree. I think the vast majority of patients are going to get enrolled based on non-invasive ischemia testing. But in theory, you could do it with a pressure wire in some select cases. But I think those will be pretty small. And they also have to be able to exercise. So that's, they do. this is going to be hard. It'll be, I mean, 190 on each arm is going to be, that's ambitious. It is. I mean, I think there's no 
two ways about it. It's a challenging trial to enroll into because, you know, if we get into the nitty gritty of it, they need to exercise. It, the, the protocols recently changed, but I think from memory, uh, they need to go at least two minutes on the treadmill, but they can't go more than, I think, eight minutes. And so there needs to be, you know, this sweet spot of they need to be able to exercise, but get angina when they treadmill. And then they actually need to have two exercise tests, which aren't variable. They need to be something like less than 20% variability. So it's hard to get patients in. And, you know, we've had pay a lot of patients screen out at various points of the process. So the patients honestly have to be committed. A lot of them are because they have such terrible symptoms and haven't had, you know, been told often that they haven't had things that can be done for them. And then also the investigators have to be committed. You have to really work, as I say, work hard on their meds, work hard on getting the ischemia test, the eligibility, if they fail the exercise, figure out why and if you need to do it again. But it is, it's a challenging trial to, to recruit into. The main, um, the randomized portion, so the, the, those 380 patients are those with left coronary ischemia. There is a, and those get randomized. So again, placebo procedure or true sinus reducer implant. After six months and the follow-up is concluded, the patients that were randomized to placebo can then get the reducer implant. So it's something just for patients to know so to cross over yeah. for them. Okay. Yes. So they have to wait six months for the primary endpoint, but they will be able to get the device eventually because, you know, obviously these patients, are, you know, some patients participate in clinical trials just because they're completely altruistic and things like that. But for the vast majority, if you are going to able to offer them a therapy that they otherwise could not access, that's a big motivation for patients to participate. Certainly. In these so you've yeah. got to make sure that they know that. That's the randomized portion. The registry single arm uh, patients all get the implant and those are either with right coronary ischemia or with Anoka Manoka. So those patients can will, you know, be in the study, not in the randomized portion, in the single arm, in the registry, and those just get the implant. Um, I would say for when people are getting up and running with the trial, a really nice thing if you're able to do it is that when you're doing your first cases, try and line up one of each so that even if your first case gets randomized to placebo, your second one is an implant, and so the whole team gets used to you know doing the procedure. That's I, I would say like the That's optimal way if it's if it's possible to do. Um, as I say, for pay, for eligibility, they have to have severe angina, so CCS class three or four, and then angina symptoms despite optimal medical therapy. That as there is this you know the case review committee is going to look at the meds that they're on. It has to be a really righteous effort of medical therapy. It can't be kind of you know, low dose nitrate and low dose beta blocker and that's it. You have to try and treat them optimally medically. If patients can't tolerate, you know, escalating doses or certain drug agents, that's completely fine and that's accepted. There just has to have been an attempt and it has to be documented. And the no revascularization options, as I say, is important. You have to, if you are going to put the patient in the trial, commit to not revascularizing them for those six months. Um, because that's going to just, you know, confound everything. You're not going to get the true effect of reducer. I would say that when the device is eventually, which I think it will be, approved, you don't have to do it in that way. You know, the, we'll talk a little bit in a second about the implant, but it's safe, it's easy, it's low risk, it's quick. And so you actually might, in clinical practice, want to elevate that in your algorithm. If the patient's revascularization option is very high end or risky, if it's, you know, uh, post cabbage cerc CTO with only epicardial collaterals and whatever. Instead of failing revascularization, you could, if you wanted, try the sinus reducer first, knowing that it's not going to, if the patient doesn't respond or they're still symptomatic, you still have the option to go back and revascularize them later. Sure. So for trial That's purposes, they have to say no revasc options and you won't do it for six months. Clinical practice may end up being different. Makes sense. Um, this is the QR code for if, um, if people out there have patients that they want to refer um, they are also honestly looking for more sites so i think if people are interested then please get in contact with um, folks at shockwave to participate um, in terms of the actual procedure as i said it's it's what i would tell people is that it's it's easy it's low risk it's quick uh, from europe where it's been done you know a lot more extensively than here the safety data are reassuring and it's actually very it's not in any way equipment or you know labor intensive for the cath lab at all so you know you need ij access obviously everybody knows how to do that you put i think a nine french sheath uh, in the jugular 
And then you just take a multi-purpose diagnostic catheter and you cannulate the coronary sinus. Um, that is not that difficult, can take a couple of minutes. You know, a lot of us aren't used to cannulating the CS frequently, but it's obviously, you know, pretty straightforward to do. You just hook up the multi-purpose with a syringe of contrast and just do hand injections and then confirm that you're in, advance your catheter. You then take an angiogram to see the anatomy of the sinus to make sure it's suitable. And ideally you wanna see a valve and that's where you're gonna deploy your device. You then just put a regular J wire or if you feel like you need extra support because the bends are difficult, you can put a super core or something up. And then you advance you know, delivery catheter and through that you advance the reducer. It's self-expanding, it's one si size. And then you deploy it, you take an angio to confirm, um, and then you recapture it and take it all out. But it's, you know, my experience, it's been a safe, easy, quick procedure. And also from speaking to folks that have done more of it, um, they report the same thing. And so I do think that, you know, if this trial is positive, and then we have two other positive trials, I'm sure that that is going to be enough for FDA approval. And then we have access to it, and then it's up to us to decide how to deploy it. It's just another, I would say, tool in your armamentarium. You can consider it like an anti-anginal drug. You know, you can try it first, and then you can try revascularization after. I think, for, you know, if the revascularization options are more straightforward, then you can revascularize people first. But I think, you know, that will come with experience as we start to use this more to figure out where it fits in your algorithm, how high up it is. And it will be different for each patients certain patients you're going to want to deploy it earlier and certain patients it's probably going to be kind of the option of last resort and it does is all the equipment built to be ij only could you do this femorally does it how does that from a venous standpoint can you pretty much do it from anywhere i or think the you equipment not long enough potentially i don't know if the equipment is long enough and just the angles are going to be so much harder because uh, right. you're just going to have to i mean same as like doing a right heart catheter of the groin is painful compared to the neck. It's just the puncture is easier, more comfortable for the patient. But the angles here are so easy. You just go in from the IJ, you get down, and then you just make one turn up into the CS. Um, and you, you know, as I say, you can cannulate the CS in you know two minutes from from that approach. So I think you, you know, if there were reasons that precluded you getting in, maybe you could do it femorally. Um, I can try and find out. But I think yeah, the the it the angles of attack are just so favorable and easy from the neck perfect that's awesome well thank you man we appreciate it uh, i think this is very educational for all of us i look forward to sort of seeing how this goes for you guys and for every, all the sites and also honestly seeing how the european experience which is a bit farther ahead of us sort of what they do where they put it in their algorithm over there uh maybe it'll be informative in helping us decide where we put it in our algorithm too you know so Anyway, thanks, man. Appreciate you. Thank you.